Welcome back. In this video, I'll try to explain self-organizing map uh, maps and how they can be used for clustering. This is the last video of our clustering tutorials. We're doing partitive clustering. The last one is self-organizing map maps. Now, SOMs or self-organizing maps, they're used for visualization and analysis of high-dimensional data sets. High dimensional data means data with a large number of input variables or features, for example, uh, thousands of features or something like that. Now, what they do is they facilitate the presentation of high dimensional data sets into lower dimensional ones, usually one dimensional, two dimensional, or three dimensional. Uh, it's an unsupervised learning algorithm and does not require a target vector since it learns and classifies data without supervision. I'm, uh, supervision. I'm assuming we know the difference between supervised learning and unsupervised learning. For supervised learning we have data and already we have the corresponding classes of each data point whereas for unsupervised learning we don't know we have only have the data but we don't know uh, the corresponding classes or clusters for every data point. Um, an SOM is formed from a grid of nodes or units to which the input data are presented. Every node is connected to the input and there is no connection between the nodes so there's no connection between the nodes SOM is a topology preserving technique and keeps the neighborhood relations in its mapping presentation this is what they look like usually we have a grid usually n by n or m by m so uh, the number of rows equals the number of columns 4 by 4 this one is and um, every node is connected to the input, so these are two input vectors or two input points. Every node is connected to the input the same way, and no nodes are connected to each other. Now, what I'd like you to understand from this video is just the intuition behind self-organizing maps. After that, the theory of calculating, uh, of doing the calculations and the computations should not be too difficult. But we just need to understand why it works or the intuition behind it. Now. Uh, say we start by having an m by m grid or a lattice. Let's say it's two by two, three by three, or four by four. It doesn't matter. If you look look at this now, don't worry about the squares. This is a three by three lattice. So that's one, two, three, one, two, three. We're interested in these nodes here, the, these black circles. Each node of these has weights for input variables in the data. For example, if we have 100 input variables or 100 feature features in the data then each node will have 100 weights each of these will have uh, 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 weights the same number of weights as the number of input variables in our data if we have p uh, input variables we have p weights in each node based on the weights now and data points in our data the instances in our data we find the best fitting node in the grid for each data point. What that means is because each node now has weights and we have our data points, you know, uh, data one, data two, data point number three, and so on and so forth. For each of these data points, we need to find the best matching node, the one that uh, best matches the, uh, the that data point using the weights and the values in that data point. And we, iterat we iteratively update the weights and position of each data point in the grid so we we'll repeat that iteratively and in the end uh, similar data points will naturally be in the same nodes uh, that does not necessarily mean that each of these nine nodes for example will have data points no but similar data points will fall into similar nodes we can have for example only three nodes occupied by some examples the rest of them can be empty that means we have three clusters on our data and the points in each node are similar. That's the intuition behind it. As I said, if you just understand this and how it works, then the theory should not be very difficult. I mean, the way we do the calculations. So the algorithm works as, is fo as follows. We initialize each node's weights with a random number between 0 and 1. Remember, each node will have uh, uh, a weight vector. The number of weights there is similar to the number of uh, uh, input variables or features. Then we choose a random input feature from, I'm sorry, a random input vector or a random point from the training data set. After that, we calculate the best matching unit. Now, each node is examined to find uh, the one which its weights are most similar to the input vector. 
this unit is known as the best matching unit I'm sorry since its vector is most similar to the input vector this selection is done by Euclidean distance formula which is a measure of similarity between two data sets the distance between the input vector and the weights of node is calculated in order to find the BMU or the best matching unit so we find the BMU using uh, Euclidean distance basically we're trying to find uh, for each data point the node which has the more the, the closest weight sort of after that we calculate the size of the neighborhood around the best matching unit the size of the neighborhood around the best matching unit is decreasing with an exponential decay function and it shrinks on each iteration until reaching just the BMU so we have a, some sort of neighborhood around a certain BMU and that neighborhood size keeps decreasing with time until we just reach the BMU that means neighborhood the size of neighborhood becomes uh, zero so if you try to visualize it this is our grid now let's say uh, we have that node the size of the neighborhood for the BMU is uh, that big at one uh, point of time and then at some other iteration it may be uh, uh, that big so it keeps decreasing and uh, the decreasing is done as follows sigma of t equals sigma sigma 0 e to the power uh, minus t over lambda sigma 0 is the width of the lattice at time 0 so at the beginning sigma 0 is the width of the lattice ie uh, if we have n by n then sigma 0 is n in the beginning t is the current time step as we iterate and lambda is the time is a time constant the value of lambda depends on sigma 0 and the chosen number of iterations for the algorithm so here we notice that the size of neighborhood around the BMU keeps shrinking and keeps getting smaller after that we modify the nodes weights of the BMU and the, the neighboring nodes so that their weight uh, gets more smaller I'm sorry more similar to the weight of the input vector so we need the weight uh, of, of um, we need the weights of the BMU to be similar to the weight of the input vector. The weight of every node within the neighborhood is adjusted, having greater change for neighbors closer to the BMU. So if the, uh, the, the ones close to the BMU will have greater change in their weight. And that's how we change the weight. W of t plus 1 equals W of t, i.e. the weight at the previous step, plus this value here. t is the time st step and L is a learning rate which keeps changing and keeps decreasing as uh, time progresses as we iterate the decay of the learning rate L now as I mentioned L is the learning rate in there in our equation the change or the decay in the learning rate is calculated for each iteration LT equals L0 uh, e to power minus T over lambda L0 is the learning rate at, uh, uh, at the beginning as training goes on the neighborhood gradually shrinks so the number of neighbors gets smaller at the end of training the neighborhood have shrunk the neighborhoods will have shrunk to zero size so the uh, neighborhood will be zero uh, according to that equation as you can see in front of you as I said if you understand just the intuition behind it these things will be easy to compute now a few things to notice the influence rate shows amount of influence of a node's distance from the BMU has on its learning uh, in the simplest form uh, influence rate is equal to 1 for all the nodes close to the PMU and 0 for others but a Gaussian function is also common finally from a random distribution of weights and through much iteration self-organizing map is able to arrive at a map of stable zones at the end interpretation of data is to be done by a human but SOM is a great technique to represent to present the invisible patterns in the data as we mentioned before going back to the uh, I'm sorry going back to the intuition behind it if we just understand how it works and why it works then the doing the calculations is not a big issue I'm going to stop here this is the last video in our classroom algorithms and I'll see you in my next video